Well, in our series this, uh, these last few weeks or months, we've been taking a look at things that we don't necessarily talk about because either you know they're kind of taboo or scary, um, they might step on toes, or just things that you know oftentimes don't di- get discussed very much, like the book of Leviticus. But uh, this morning we're going to kind of start a mini-series within this series because one of the things that at least I don't talk a lot about and uh, I think kind of depends on what region of the United States you kind of reside in. Uh, Sometimes this gets talked about way too much, and sometimes it gets talked about way too little. And that is kind of the topic of politics. Um, Oftentimes we don't see politics and religion mixing very well. Um, And there's usually kind of two extremes. One extreme is, you know, trying to shove religion or... or, um, uh, faith into politics, and uh, the other extreme usually is let's just let's just leave politics alone. Let's just kind of ignore it and not talk about it at all, and uh, because it's just it's politics. You know, you, you know, no one likes to talk about politics usually, but it usually ends up that every conversation ends up as a political conversation, uh, no matter what. And so the the extreme is like, you know, scripture, God. Faith, they don't really have any um, say in the matter of politics or anything. And so uh, we're going to take a few weeks to kind of explore some of these topics, these ideas. And uh, my hope is that um, no one's offended. (laughs) Uh, My hope is to help us think biblically. My hope is to uh, perhaps challenge our maybe some of the things that we have held on to, maybe things that we've held on to for a very long time and reconsider or rethink through those things, not necessarily abandon them or or, uh, not necessarily advocating for minds to be changed per se, but um, simply trying to bring perspective and trying to uh, challenge us, myself included, in kind of how we think and approach uh, politics and kind of what is God's... uh, role in that in a lot of ways. So those are the things that we're going to explore. Now, I also want to kind of caution everyone here this morning because a lot of you don't come to Sunday school, um, Sunday mornings around, uh, well, the official time's 9.30. I don't usually get there till like 9.40 or 9.45, and then we usually talk for a while. So there's like 20 minutes for Sunday school um, in, in the end sometimes, but um, uh, we we're kind of talking. We're, we're working through right now Second Corinthians, uh, and and we were in First Corinthians. But just some of the dynamics of what it is to to be a church that receives one of these letters from Paul, and what that implies, and a lot of those implications are the church coming together and the the letter being read uh, read aloud, because ninety five percent of the ancient world did not uh, read or write, and so this had to be read to the congregation, and so. That automatically changed a lot of the, changes a lot of the dynamics that we have when it comes to reading uh, Paul's letters because, in a lot of ways, we don't think community. We think individualistically because it's often uh, our practice to kind of take uh, one of Paul's letters, break it up over time, and read it to ourselves and see how what we can learn and what we can apply. Whereas, again, when the Romans would have re- the Roman house churches when they would have received this letter they would have congregated and the person who brought the letter to them would have read it to them and so that kind of led into some questions and discussion about you know would they just kind of sit there and be quiet throughout the whole thing or would they be asking questions and and maybe even possibly debating the things that Paul's telling them while the letter's being read and it's my imagination that yes those dynamics would have existed they would have asked questions they would have they would have interrupted. They would have challenged some things and, and possibly likely be upset about some of the things that Paul had to say. And so uh, I threw out there that some, a practice of mine, usually in all cases of teaching with, with students and things, uh, is that I invite questions. I, I, I enjoy having the uh, questions. And uh, I think a lot of times there's more learning done through kind of question and answer and a discussion over a question rather than just kind of a, a lecture. And so I accused all of us, including myself, because I often, when I sit under someone's teaching, don't do this. 
uh, we're, we're all trained to, especially during the sermon, not ask questions. And I kind of encourage the Sunday school people that if they have questions, kind of ask their question during, during the sermon. So I don't know if anyone will do that or not. Um, I did warn them that, you know, I tend to be long anyway, and so that might just prolong things a little bit more, which might scare some people and things. But I just want to give everyone a warning. If someone's asking a question, they're not doing anything to offend me, or, or I think uh, they, they're not doing anything that should offend any of us, um, because again, that, that is, I think, a lot of ways how uh, the ancient communities that would have received these letters would have gone about things. And so, uh, obviously, we do have some time limits, and so um, we, we do have to kind of, you know, moderate that somewhat. But nonetheless, um, if someone were to ask a question, that's why. So don't, don't be appalled or shocked. Um, I've, I've kind of opened the door, as it were. So, hey, before we dive in, let's pray uh, before we take a look at Romans 13. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning to be in your word, and we pray that uh, we would be good hearers, and that we might be challenged, and, but ultimately, Father, transformed. And so be with us, we ask. It's in Jesus' name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we pray. Amen. All right. So let's go to Romans 13 and take a look at what it says as Paul writes to the church, or I should say the Roman house churches uh, that are in the city of Rome in the early first century. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do not Uh, do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you not, uh, do, excuse me, do you what, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you'll be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also, uh, this is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what, it, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does, not harm, uh, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of of the flesh. So there's Romans 13. A passage that you may be somewhat familiar with, especially verse 1, where it says that let everyone be subject to the governing authority, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that God uh, the authorities that exist have been established by God. And Oftentimes, this is a passage that Christians know especially well when it comes to politics. There's one other passage that often gets uh, brought into the conversation when we talk about politics, and that comes to us in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, where Peter and John tell the Sanhedrin, after being told by the Sanhedrin to stop preaching in the name of Jesus, they respond to the Sanhedrin by saying it is better for us to obey God rather than human beings. 
And so oftentimes, these two passages get brought into any conversation about politics. And when we examine our own culture and society over the last few years, we see Romans 13 used in a lot of different ways. It was used against the 2016 Black Lives Matter protests. It was uh, quoted to support separating children from their parents uh, of immigrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. And it was hotly debated during the 2020 COVID-19 lockdowns and mask mandates. People oftentimes ran to Romans 13. The problem that exists when uh, these matters come about is that both sides of the debate use these passages. And so we likely ourselves used Romans 13, especially Romans 13, 1, to support our political viewpoint. And oftentimes when it comes to Romans 13, we don't even need to explain our interpretation because in a lot of ways we just simply say, look, it says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. So in other words, our logic usually goes along the lines of, if we don't listen and follow the governing authorities, which were established by God, in the end what we're doing is we're rebelling against God. And for some reason, kind of the American tradition and understanding of Romans 13 is that it always means to obey the government. And when you kind of do a historical survey of kind of where does this interpretation come from? It actually begins, for America anyway, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. But Romans 13 doesn't get used oftentimes by the people we think would use it. The separatists, the, the patriots, they would often cite passages in Galatians uh, and other places in the New Testament that talk about freedom, that, that God is about freedom and not tyranny. But yet it was in the hands of the loyalists, those who were loyal to the king of England, that used Romans 13. You need to use Romans 13. Or you need to look at Romans 13, because if you're going to rebel against the king, then you're ultimately rebelling against God's authority, because God uh, divinely placed the king in charge over us. Now, I don't know where you land politically. I don't know where you land uh, historically when you look back on the Revolutionary War, but it's my experience that most Americans look very favorably upon the rebellion of the American colonies towards the King of England. But yet there are a lot of us who kind of see some of the things that were happening in our society just merely seven years ago with various protesters and the idea was, well, we're on lockdown. You need to be going home. You shouldn't be gathering in the streets to protest. And so on one hand, we're saying the patriots had every cause to disobey the governing authorities and rebel. And yet, in a context like the, the riots and things that took place a few years ago, well, everyone's disobeying the governing authorities. They're supposed to be on lockdown. They're supposed to be in their homes. They're not supposed to be congregating in the streets. And here you are standing, supporting both sides, using Rome or various sides, using Romans 13 for completely different reasons. So it seems that Romans 13 becomes a verse that is particularly useful when we want to use it and we ignore it when it doesn't serve or you are useful to us in our purposes. And that's a problem. Romans 13 throughout American history was used to support uh, the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act, which argued that anyone who helped fugitive slaves was in violation of their duty to obey the government. During the Civil War, northern preachers accused the southern seceding states that they were in violation of Romans 13. And many Christians quoted it against the Civil Rights Movement and Vietnam War protests in the 1960s. 
And yet again, when we reflect upon the Revolutionary War, there's very little criticism of the patriots going, they disobeyed Romans 13. They shouldn't have did, they shouldn't have done that. There shouldn't have been a rebellion. They should have followed Romans 13. Be obedient to the king. That's the governing authority over them. There should have been no um, United States in that respect. So I think it becomes very clear, and I think in a lot of ways we're all susceptible and all at some point guilty of this, myself included, to where we quickly jump to a passage like Romans 13 or Acts 5, and we use it because it supports our political or ideological viewpoint. And again, that's the problem. The problem is oftentimes when we kind of hold on to a viewpoint or hold on to a political uh, idea, we run to Scripture going, okay, where does this, where am I supported in believing this? That's going in the wrong direction. We're moving in the wrong direction. When we take a political viewpoint and run to Scripture for support of that biblical viewpoint, we're doing the process backwards. Rather, we should let the Bible inform us on what our political views ought to be. And so, when it comes to Romans 13, what does Romans 13 actually mean? Because we admit that there are times and even biblical examples of people telling government or ruling authorities, no, we are to obey God rather than human beings. And even in Paul's own experience, as Paul is going around the Roman world and he gets arrested by the Romans, we see at the end of Acts, when he's on trial by the Roman governor Felix and Festus, those two Roman governors, we see him defend himself. We see him like, I am not causing any problems to the Roman state. But yet, He's arrested by the Roman state. Yet he's ultimately killed for being a political prisoner of the Roman state. So how is it that Paul can write to the Roman community just at point blank, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities? Because that's not even true in his own life. In his own experience. And through our experiences and throughout historical uh, research, we come to find out that Yes, government can produce and can cause a lot of human suffering. There's a lot of evil and wrongdoing by these governing authorities. And so, when governments do bad or wrong things, should we just jump in and be supportive? Because, boy, we better be obeying the government authorities. Romans 13.1 says that. And obviously, when we come to various political issues, we notice ourselves using Romans 13 in support of things that are in favor of the government, and we ignore it when we're not in favor of the government, and we go to Acts chapter 5. So, obviously, Paul does not necessarily have the intention that Romans 13, chapter, or chapter 13, verse 1, is to kind of being accepted universally in every circumstance of everything that government does. It just doesn't seem to compute that way. And so how can we stop selectively applying it to the various government actions and, and laws that governments produce? And how can we stop playing this game of ignore it when it's not convenient and apply it when we need to or want to because it supports our side of things? Well, here the first thing to be said is, is that with all texts of Scripture, it comes in a context. It comes to the Roman house churches who uh, um, have not seen uh, Roman government always doing the right thing, obviously. Uh, the Romans proliferate a lot of evil around the empire. There's a lot of favoritism. There's a lot of, of uh, um, well, what's the word? Corruption. You know, government officials being bribed, government officials taking the sides of the wealthy over the poor, 
There's all these various evil dynamics taking place under Roman authority. And so how is it that Paul can ask the Christians in the Roman house churches be subject to the governing authorities? And when we look at the context that it fits in, not just the historical one, but uh, the literary context that it is in, what Paul is ultimately trying to accomplish in the Roman house churches is reconciliation. It becomes clearer in chapters to follow chapter 13 that there are these two groups who are at odds with one another. And Paul simply desires for them to come. And the thing that separates them is that there is a particular group who thinks that they need to take on a Jewish ethnic identity in order to be Christian, in order to be God's people. And so, as Paul's working to reconcile them, chapters 1-8 through eight is a focus on your Jewish, or he should, I should say from his standpoint, our Jewish heritage in no way gives us any better advantage or any advantage at all over being saved than anyone else. So basically what he's arguing to, to the group who thinks that they have to take on this Jewish heritage is that he goes through the, the history of creation and the fall. He goes through the history of Israel uh, um, in, in the early chapters of Romans, talking about Adam and, and Christ. Uh, and all those various dynamics, he's ultimately arguing that taking on a Jewish ethnic identity gains you nothing. Because the Jews stand on the same platform as the Gentiles in terms of people who have rebelled against God. So all stand condemned, all stand guilty, all stand as sinners. And he talks about how salvation comes to all equally through faith in Christ. Then in chapters 9 through 11, Paul's working to show how God has changed uh, the agent of salvation, that it was salvation was to come through Israel. It was Israel that was to, to be the agent whom God rec rectified or re reconciled the nations to himself. Uh, Israel has obviously failed at that task, and so. God is now doing it in the person of Jesus Christ. And Paul needs to kind of explain that. And then in chapter 12, Paul now takes these realities as to why they need to come together, share a table together, reconcile with one another, and brings those things into reality, into practice. How do these re theological and universal realities about who they are as human beings, as people under God, how do they then reconcile together? Well, he gets implicit. He brings practical application to these realities. Another way in which we look at the literary context is notice how, how God positions governing authorities. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. When you kind of take a step back and take a look at verse 1 a little bit more intimately, you do see Paul lending uh, God's authority to the governing authorities as a, a commendation. You, you see God kind of saying, yes, governing authorities are there for multiple benefits. And so their authority is kind of, kind of lifted up a little bit. But yet at the same time, it's, it, we notice Paul kind of being backhanded. Because what Paul is ultimately saying is that the governing authorities that are over you Christians are ultimately established by God's authority or Christ's authority. And so their authority is not derived in their own splendor. Their authority is not derived or rooted in the emperor or the Roman gods. It's in God's authority. So in a lot of ways, Paul here is, is demoting Roman authority. That it's not really all that impressive authority because it's not authority that they have, have gained themselves. It's not really their authority. It's an authority that has been given to them by God. So in a lot of ways, Paul is diminishing Roman authority. 
So again, what could Paul have meant by something like verse 3 later on, where he says, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right. Again, in Paul's own experience, this seems to be contrary. His Lord and his Savior was, was murdered by Roman authorities for not breaking a single Roman law. And Paul himself suffered under Roman authority, even though he was never one to break Roman authority. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. So why would Paul think that all human government were God's servants? When every human governor has, or government has caused, again, great evil and suffering. Again, when we look at the greater context, Paul here is telling the Roman house churches this infighting, this, this war that you have going on between these two groups and you don't want to meet to one another, that is stirring the pot. Rome in its history up to this point already has seen multiple emperors come to power and come out of power who have been kind to Jews and also uh, suspicious of Jews. And so Nero, under his rule, he dispersed all the Jews from Rome. They were to leave. And so Paul, I think here, is advocating to the Roman house churches, your fighting is going to get attention. Especially for you, the weak group who wants to take on this Jewish ethnic identity. If you do that, then you're going to get kicked out of Rome because you're claiming to be Jewish and the Jews have been expelled from Rome. And so then there could be no reconciliation. And so... Paul, I think, is just trying to advocate to, the, to these Roman house churches, just stay under the radar. Just be people who, who exist in, in, in harmony with the government. And when we back up, again, looking at the literary context, we go back to chapter 12, and what we ultimately see when he says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in chapter 12, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that is your true uh, in proper worship, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve w uh, what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. Again, the context is community. It's community. So what does he mean by verse 2? Do not conform to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? Hierarchy. Hierarchy is the pattern of this world. The emperor's on top. Everyone else is below the emperor. And then you have magistrates, you have governors, you have proconsuls, you have generals, you have, you have all this hierarchy over you. That's the pattern of this world. So I want you to be a community like no other community. I want you to be a community as he's advocating through the theological um, uh, arguments that he lays out in 1 through 8. I want you to be a community of mutuality, of unity. A, a community that strips away all these various um, walls and, and markers of separation so that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, so that there's no distinction between rich and poor, male and female. All these various things that Paul advocates, not only in Romans, but also in Galatians and other places. So I want you to be a community like no other. Okay? If I'm going to be a community like no other and not have this hierarchical structure and operate our community like the Roman community, so then when it comes to Romans 13, what is Paul saying ultimately? Paul's saying, yet as your own community, acting and living distinctly different from the community around you, nonetheless, you are still a participant in that community. You belong to the greater Roman community, so I want you to contribute. How do I want you to contribute? How do I want you to participate? Be subject to the governing authorities. Don't be a rebellious people. Don't see your uniqueness as God's people somehow uh, as motivation to throw off Roman oppression and Roman rules and Roman laws. 
Yet, we know from the whole counsel of God, like Acts chapter 5, and Paul would probably advocate by way of experience, that Roman government doesn't always do things rightly. And in those circumstances, then yes, it is right to obey God rather than human beings. But that ultimately takes discernment. And that is not something that Paul necessarily dives into and and tries to expand upon in this text. He talks about how authority, government, rules over to help maintain peace. You know, they do a fairly decent job at making sure evil stays away and good prospers. And so verse 5, therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. In other words, you are called to be someone of peace. Again, this is reflective of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers. You're to be peaceful. Yes, there might be times, there might be situations where you need to stand against the the authorities who are over you and follow God rather than human beings or human authority. But in general, for most practices, be submissive to the government, to the governing authorities. And even Paul gets specific here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, yeah, verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. And in verse 6, again, this is why you pay taxes. You pay taxes because you are a participant in the Roman world as a community who is distinct. And so don't be a community thinking like, boy, we, we should be somewhat special and separate from everyone else because we are. So that means we shouldn't have to pay taxes. No, pay your taxes. So what Paul is advocating here is is discernment, that there needs to be a general attitude of submission. And it ultimately takes discernment. And again, based on what we know what Paul goes through, based on what we know of of other examples and, and Scripture as a whole, I don't believe Paul is telling Christians that this is just a blind or blank command to always obey government. There are real times to defy the government, to defy governing authority. And the difficulty is to know when. The difficulty is to know when. And that's always the case. Again, we come back, I come back to looking at mask mandates and, and the government shutdown. People looked at Romans 13. Okay, we need to obey the governing authority. So we need, to, we need to close our doors. We need to not meet. And yet others said, no, we're, we're commanded to meet. We should meet. And so this is something that demands for us to, to rebel or to stand against government authorities and, and rather listen to God rather than people. And it's always difficult. We saw how polarized people got. We saw how passionate people were in those debates. So when we ask the question, as we wrap these things up, what can we learn from America's misuse of the passage? Applying it when, we, when it's useful, ignoring it when it's not useful. How can we know in our time, in our place, when it is right to obey governing authorities or when we must obey God rather than human beings? Well, first, I think we learn that we cannot just cherry-pick verses to serve our own political purposes. We can't just go to Romans 13 when it's convenient for us. We can't just go to Acts chapter 5 and look at the example of, of of Peter and John and say, that we need to do that because it's convenient for us. And so I think this is what happens most of the time when people get so impassioned and and so one-sided. That people find a verse and they simply latch on to it. They're glued to it. And that is their defense. That is their stand. Rather than listening, rather than being um, 
more open-minded to what the other side has to say. So we're all at risk of doing this. And sometimes likely for good reason, because we really think that what government is doing might be wrong, or the governing authorities are wrong in the matter. But we have to be careful to check our motivations, because it is so easy for our good intentions and our good motivations to become bad motivations. When we start using Scripture to justify our political views, rather than allowing Scripture to form our political views, using Scripture as a weapon, when we start attacking one another, when we start saying, well, we're being more faithful to God's Word than you are. You need to repent. To be honest, all of us never experienced anything like that, and so all of us should be working together, conversating, and debating what is the right direction to move. Rather than taking a side and screaming at each other, you're wrong. The Bible says. You're wrong. The Bible says because both sides were doing it. When both sides take Scripture and attack the other side with it, that's a pretty good indication that there's something wrong here. A good theology sits in the tension between subject to authority and the idea that we obey God rather than human beings. Sitting in that tension. We see both to be true. And it takes discernment and wisdom to kind of know what direction to move in and what ultimately to do. I think there's some rather direct context in which the answer is more clear than other times. In the context of, of Peter and John, they were specifically told, you are not allowed to preach in the name of Jesus. Because that was a threat to their beliefs, their theology, and ultimately, they saw it as a disturbance to the peace that they have with Rome, and it threatened their power. And so in turn, Peter and John tell them, no. I understand that Jesus is a threat to your power. I understand that Jesus is controversial. I understand that you fear that it's going to expand to the Roman world and, and threaten this peace and, and it's going to bring your destruction. But we are called by God to preach Jesus Christ. And so that is what we're going to do. That's the context. And so if governing authorities came to us in that specific light and said, hey, you need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Rather, you need to start preaching uh, in the name of President whoever. That would be, I think, a clear draw the line from the ancient world context to our context and go, yes, we're going to preach in the name of Jesus. So-and-so person is not Lord and Savior. Jesus alone. Beyond that, everything else gets really, really muddy. Everything else is really, really muddy. This tension that we are participants in our American culture and we're commanded or instructed to participate. And the wisdom comes in, and the, the, the discernment comes, how do we participate? What is the best way in which we are to participate? So we need to look at the whole of Scripture, not just one or two verses. And, and the war between sides needs to not be, how can I just get one more verse over you? On my list of verses of supporting my position, if I can just have one more than you, I win. That's a bad motive as well. We also need to listen and not pit Bible verses against one another. So in developing a discernment into how to be participants, good participants in the greater culture, in the political world, it isn't easy. This discernment isn't easy to develop. It will take a lot of energy and a lot of time. It will take a diverse community. It will take asking lots of questions, learning from others, and discerning ultimately where the Holy Spirit is leading. Oftentimes, 
when we get pitted in these battles, Christian versus Christian over some political view, what ends up happening is we ignore or don't do the research of history. And we ignore and don't do the research of other communities. Do you you know that during the government shutdowns and the mask mandates where Christians were all up in arms about our freedom, all up in arms about how we don't we we shouldn't be listening to the government on this we should be able to congregate together we don't we shouldn't have to wear masks christians are all over the board on this did you know that the black community sat there going boy this seems familiar because they've lived through it they've lived through it not just in contemporary times in the 1960s but through all our American history where they've been screaming and yelling that scripturally they are human beings. Scripturally, they are to be free people. While various parts of Christendom said, no. The government says, especially in the South, the government say, you are to be segregated. You are to be a slave. You are, you are to not be able to have any type of freedom or rights at all. And how often did white evangelicals just stop for a moment in the midst of the debates and turn to a community who's lived through these things and just sat there and listened and go, oh, and inform how we should see things and inform how we should be better participants. So it takes a diverse community to develop this discernment. It takes asking lots of questions. It takes listening to develop this discernment. In future weeks, we're going to talk about loyalties. We're going to talk about the various loyalties that we have to political parties or political people and just the mess that we can get in when we have those type of loyalties and what it ultimately communicates to our loyalty to Christ and all that. But just scratching the surface here, when we take a side and we get so entrenched, we stop listening and stop asking questions. We stop developing that discernment, that godly wisdom, and what might be the best practice to do. Because the reality is is that there's a lot more gray. There's a lot more of, of a muddy mess than there is a lot of clarity in how to operate. And so maybe a good starting point is asking the questions, Is the government action contributing to human flourishing or taking from it? Is the government action promoting a love for others? Is government action contributing to human flourishing or taking from it? Is the government action promoting a love for others? Now, again, those questions are a starting point. Uh, Those questions can lead down a, a lot of different alleyways and rabbit holes. And, and, and um, even though the government might be bringing some sort of human flourishing uh, to, to humanity, it still yet might be wrong. Again, answering a yet, these are not trying to be yes or no questions. They are simply a starting point to start exploring and listening and, and grappling and wrestling with these things. Look at the Corinthian community. You want a good example of what it is to wrestle with one's culture as Christian. Look at the Corinthian community. Look at the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians and how they are trying to sort these things out. It's okay to be in the midst of a mess. It is okay to not know exactly how to navigate the gray. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, we have a desire to do what is right and what is good and what honors God ultimately. But God is not going to stand there condemning us as we move slowly and explore what is the best way to participate in our culture, in our community, and how we interact with the governing authorities over us. And so, we have to pay careful attention. Are we people who often use Romans 13.1 to support things and then turn right around and ignore Romans 13.1 when we don't think the government is doing what it should be doing or that, that policy or that law is right or good? 
just to take a couple minor things as examples here to wrap up. I can remember years ago, um, I was actually old enough to remember this. Years ago, there was a strong debate in Michigan. Uh, they passed a law that required seatbelts to be worn. More recently, uh, there was a law under one governor who said you had to wear a helmet riding your motorcycle. Then the next governor comes along and says, no, you don't have to. And the next government comes along and says, no, you don't have to wear your helmet as you ride a motorcycle. Christians would go to Romans 13. Uh, government says you have to wear your seatbelt, so you, you should obey the governing authorities. I mean, at the simplistic level, again, not a paintbrush, a broad paintbrush by any means, but at the simplistic level, Paul does seem to be advocating that people would obey and respect and honor the governing authorities. So when it comes to a seatbelt law, should we listen or should we go, no, we need to listen to God rather than men or human beings? Well, seeming that God had nothing to say about seatbelts, you're going to be hard-pressed to say, I need to listen to God rather than human beings, number one. Number two, again, asking this question, does it bring human flourishing? Yeah, it's statistics and studies seem to show that wearing seatbelts, especially in the midst of accidents, does seem to give a greater uh, uh, chance of surviving with less injury. That's a good thing. So maybe we should support such ideas. But again, the rhetoric that I heard around my community was, oh, they're infringing on my rights. I have a right to do what I want in my vehicle. But if we stop and think, and try to let the Bible inform us of how we should think, which again, there's a large emphasis on justice, a large emphasis on hospitality and love for one another. Again, as Paul concludes here in Romans 13, he says what? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And so, if following said law helps us to love each other better, then maybe it's good. Again, it's, it's not a universal. It requires discernment and to develop that discernment, a conversation, listening, all those aspects. The danger I want to warn us is, is to pay attention to our lives, not just individually, but as a community, that we don't just jump on some bandwagon or that we just jump to Romans 13 or to Acts 5 and say that's the way it is. And then when the next thing comes along, Oh, wait, well, um, I want to ignore that passage and, and, and hold on to this one rather than looking at the whole council and weighing it out going, hmm, what is the best way? That's the challenge. And that is how we can work to be transformed is to do this as a community, to talk and conversate, to think through and not just be entrenched and start hurling insults and, and hurts at the other side. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for our time this morning to just begin exploring kind of how our relationship with our culture and our world is to be. How are we to be participants? Especially when it comes to politics. How are we to operate? What are we to be like? How are we to think? Help us, Father, not to be inconsistent by taking verses that we want that show, our, that show support for our view and ignoring the others. But we would consider the whole counsel that You have given us. To work, with, to work through it with diligence and hard work. We thank You, Father. Just continue to be working on us transform us to be better, be more like Christ. It's in Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen.